Hi there, it is great to be together on a weekend that I guess we'll be calling it Valentine's Day weekend. And it's a celebration that's worthy of having because God's given us special people in our lives and we've experienced love and it's blessed us and it has made our life wonderful and we're so thankful for those people and we're thankful for the connection that God's given. And so I'm glad that uh, on this weekend we might spend a little bit of time reflecting on those people who have loved us dearly whom we love as well. It is a good thing to do. We want to go to our great and glorious Lord. We want to thank him for who he is, thank him for the love that he has allowed us to experience and and to pray for people that we care about in our community. So let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Father God, we praise your name. Your name is holy. Your name is worthy. You are righteous and you are good. And we are so thankful that you have shown us all these things to be true of yourself and we marvel. And as we are amazed at you, we are also fulfilled for we know the one true God and he is great and he is wonderful. And we lift up the name of Jesus. Thank you for how you have saved us and redeemed us and given us your righteousness by your blood. We are yours and so glad to be part of your family. Father God, on this day, we have people that we care about and we want to ask that you would strengthen, encourage, and lift them up. We pray for Pastor Whitaker. I pray that after his surgery on Friday that you would give him a great recovery and it would be quick. Strengthen him along with Manda Shaw, who also was, uh, was in surgery, and we pray that her recovery takes but a short time. God, we ask for Bonnie Crater that you would strengthen her and that you would give her the ability to have energy and to enjoy her days Father God, we pray for Beth Smith, asking that you would give her all of the ability to move and navigate the way that she wants to. We pray that um, you would give her freedom from uh, the consequences that she's been fighting as a result of, of her cancer. We thank you, Father, for Dave Singler and how he's getting better, and we pray that you would make him better all the time. And Lord, we pray that you would help Sherry Ramsey, who had a difficult fall recently, help her to recover from that as well. And Father God, we thank you very much for love. You are the author of love. We love because you have first loved us, and so we thank you that Valentine's Day is here, and it is an echo of the great love that you have given to us. Thank you for people who have loved us. Thank you that we love them and make us people of love. And Father God, you have asked us to pray and to learn from you, and and so Father, as we pray, we together would like to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loves, the turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his Ashamed, I hear my mocking words call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has 
His wounds have paid my ransom. Hey church family, I want to wish you all a very special Valentine's Day. God has blessed us with wonderful people and has given us the gift of love. And celebrating love is just the right thing to do. So in order to celebrate this special day, we're going to be showing the movie I Still Believe on Sunday at 4 o'clock. So bring your Valentine or your family or your friends to watch this inspiring film. We will be having light refreshment during intermission in the fellowship hall. Next Saturday, February 20th, the men of our church are going to be gathering together for a time of breakfast and connection. So come on down to the fellowship hall at 8.30 a.m., grab your cup of coffee and jump in the buffet line. Bruce Nichols is gonna be sharing with us how generational differences can affect the work of the church. Since we desire to be a blessing to all generations, Bruce's information is gonna be so valuable to us all. Next Sunday on February 21st, a new adult Sunday school class will be starting. This class will be led by Dan Sell, Rodney Snyder, and Brian Young. And this class is gonna be exploring how every day matters as we follow Jesus. And in order to join, all you have to do is go to our multi-purpose room down by the gymnasium. Ladies, registration is open and ready to go for our IF Gathering 2021, which is gonna be taking place on March 5th and 6th. Our God is on the move, and we believe that if we trust him and if we follow, that he will lead us even if the storms of life rage on. You're able to register by going to treasurelakechurch.org and clicking the If Gathering 2021 tab. Three weeks from now on Sunday, March 7th, we're gonna be having our annual church business meeting. We like to call it TLC Together. TLC Together is going to be held during our Sunday school class, and we're going to be down in the fellowship hall. So come down for donuts, pastries, and coffee available at 9.30 a.m. TLC Together will be starting at 9.50. And remember that TLC Together is our annual church business meeting, but we're also going to be highlighting what God has done this past year and what he's going to be doing. Some of you might be familiar with this paddle and others might need to get familiar with this paddle. Pickleball is gonna be starting Tuesday evenings at 7.30 p.m. in the gymnasium. So if you're a beginner, intermediate, or semi-professional player like Pastor Bob, there is a place for you. So join in the fun, all ages are welcome. As I said before, it's Valentine's Day a very special day, a day that we get to celebrate special people. This, this one's for, for my, my dad, and this one's for my daddy. This one's for my mommy, and this one's for my mommy. For my mommy. Valentine in 1949 and he was a good-looking guy. I met my Valentine Isaiah in 2015 in marching band. This will be our first Valentine's Day together. The first Valentine's Day we spent together was in 1986. Well she's been my Valentine for 68 years. He became my Valentine in 1949. I first met Randall in 1953. Met George at a street fair. A couple of my girlfriends wanted me to meet him. I was there 
going on a double date with someone else. <laughs> I knew she was special right away. But I did notice Patty. My interest in the double date dwindled greatly. Uh, we were having a Sunday dinner in the restaurant and bowling alley that his parents owned. Uh, we met at Dubois Diner at his dad's restaurant. I was a waitress there. And I overheard him talking about that he was going out of town and he needed someone to watch Roxy for him. And I took one look at him and began making my plans. But I'll do it. I'll watch it for you. I love dogs. Just kind of talked and hung out ever since. Uh, we dated for almost a year and then we got married. Right from the very beginning, she was my Valentine. I don't remember. I don't remember anyone ever telling me. Or anyone telling me that. I don't remember anyone telling me that. Being married was so much fun. That there's a difference between a house and a home. That my Valentine would be my best friend. No one ever told me my Valentine could be the exact opposite of me. My Valentine gives me family. We had two children that uh, moved, moved around the country with us. We, we uh, relocated 14 times. She's always there to help me, no matter what. My Valentine has taught me how to pick up my broken pieces and make me become whole again. I am a very free spirit and she keeps me grounded when I need to be grounded. She was my support and all of that, there was no question about that. I guess we're the classic opposites attract. I've never had anybody give me a feeling of love like you and your children do. Patty is the best teammate I've ever had. And he went into the service for two years and appreciates me and loves and cares for my children. I prayed every night that God would bring my Valentine back from the war to spend the rest of life with me. A house is a place you live, but a home is a place for family. And I didn't have that before I had Chelsea. So on this day, I am so thankful for my Valentine. I am so blessed to celebrate this day with my Valentine. And uh, we've had a, uh, had a wonderful life together. Your Valentine should be your rock. My name is Dave, and I'm so blessed to have my wife. And uh, we've been married almost 70 years, and uh, he's waiting up there for me. In the pew in front of you, you're going to be seeing this card. If this is your first time attending Treasure Lake Church, please make sure to fill out the back of the card and set it in the offering plate as you walk out of the sanctuary. This way, we're able to give you a proper Treasure Lake Church welcome. He appears just in Matthew chapter 2. That's a very small appearance for a person in Scripture. His name is Archelaus, and we hear about Archelaus in this context. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, and he said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, he took the child and his mother, and he went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, having been warned in a dream. He withdrew to the district of Galilee. Archelaus. Archelaus Herod was a very regal name, and he was son of Herod the Great, whose reputation was perhaps the greatest builder that Israel had ever had. Herod the Great constructed the fortress of Masada. He built a mighty palace for himself and his family in Jerusalem. He refurbished the temple and took it to new heights of glory. And it would have been rather intimidating to have found yourself needing to follow in the footsteps of Herod. But that is exactly where Archelaus was. And he absolutely wanted to take the throne of his father. And as soon as Herod died, Archelaus started acting as if he was the man to make the calls. There were people who did not like his father. 
And they immediately placed demands on Archelaus. And the first ones he conceded to, but the demands kept coming and kept coming until he had to put his foot down and say no. And then there was a ruckus and there was violence in the streets of Jerusalem and he had to send the soldiers in and there was bloodshed. And after all that took place, Archelaus understood something, that he desperately needed to make his way to Rome where he would have to have a discussion with Caesar And he would have to plead with Caesar to make him king in his father's place. Well, the great surprise for Archelaus was this. By the time he arrived in Rome, he found that he was not the only person there. In fact, there was a delegation who had beaten him there that came from Israel. And it was led by his brother Antipas, who said that he should be the following heir of King Herod. And so there was a great debate in Rome about who would lead this area of Israel. Well, it seems that Caesar was rather diplomatic and he formed some sort of a compromise. And what he did for Archelaus is that he named him to be the leader of a region. A region not the full extent of his father's empire, but he gave him Samaria, Judea, and Edomia. And he was called an ethnarch, not a king. And that was the place that he would rule for the following 10 years. Now, from the story that you just heard, we learn the following things. There was a nobleman in Israel. His name was Archelaus. And Archelaus wanted to be king, but he could not make himself king. And so he had to travel to a distant kingdom in order to become a king. And when he got to that distant kingdom, he found that there was already there a group of people from his hometown who didn't like him one little bit and who did not want him to be king. That's what we learn from the story of Archelaus. And I tell you that story so that as we read the text of Luke chapter 19 for today, we might answer a few questions really quick. So we're going to turn to Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. And here are the words that Luke has for us. And while they were listening to this, he, Jesus, went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. And he said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. And so he called ten of his servants, and he gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for his servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. And the first one came and said, sir, your money has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, the master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in the small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here's your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. And he replied, I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Let's pray. Father God, we would love to understand this story, and we would love especially to know how this might change decisions that we make and make us wiser. Give us ears to hear. Help us to dial in to understand what Christ was saying on this day. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus, our Savior. Amen. I think that by starting with the story of Archelaus that we have already begun to answer some questions that naturally come up when we read this particular story. Here's the first question that's somewhat inevitable. 
Why would anyone go to a distant country to be appointed king? Well, in our day, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that was standard procedure if you were part of the Roman Empire and you had somebody as a king who was helping to govern you. And so it is not a surprise that Jesus would tell a story of somebody who goes to a different country to be appointed king. Next question is, why in this story is there included this detail that the nobleman is rejected by his countrymen? Why would you include that in verse 14? Well, that detail might be a whole lot more important than you might guess. You see, that detail is one of the primary distinctions between this story and the story that's found in Matthew chapter 25, which is the more popular story of a master who goes on a trip and who gives to his servants different things that need to be managed. You see, on this story, Jesus wanted to be made clear that in the interim, when he is gone, there is going to be a split decision about this guy who's left. And there's going to be two different attitudes about whether he's coming back and in what capacity. Because you see, the way that Jesus tells this story, there's two groups of people, and one group of people, well, they don't want this person to be king. They don't want to follow the king. And when we start thinking about Jesus as being the king, that very idea... Well, it has gospel implications for us. And so what we would like to do is we'd like to look at our story and begin by asking this question, why did Jesus tell this story in the first place? We find the answer in verse 11. Verse 11 says this, And while they were listening to this, he, Jesus, went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. There's the big idea. Jesus tells this story because the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to suddenly appear. And why would they be thinking that? They were thinking that because, well, Jesus was doing things that no one else had done before. The blind see, the lame walk, Zacchaeus. He's just completely changed his whole life. They had never seen anyone like Jesus. In fact, Jesus was creating more national news than the rest of the country put together. And people were starting to say, it sure sounds to me like he's the Messiah. So what do we know about the Messiah? Well, one of the thoughts that people had about the Messiah was this. The day will come in which the Messiah will enter into Jerusalem. And when that happens, that will trigger the coming of the kingdom of God. And like Shazam would bring change, they thought that Jesus, when he makes it to Jerusalem, he's going to bring cataclysmic change. Well, Jerusalem was just up the street, 17 miles. You can make it there in a day on foot. And so they were wondering, at this time, is everything going to end? In fact, they were pondering, are we basically now at the end of time? Is there no more time left? And I think that what you and I have observed is this, is that things change based on how much time you have. For instance, I was just with a group of people who were loading up a U-Haul truck helping Larry and Kelly Goglin move down to South Carolina. And the entire experience that we had with Larry and Kelly told me that time was on their side. For you see, they had packed boxes, they had rented a truck, they had taken apart furniture, they had time to leave with all of their belongings. Well, that was not true for a different group of people who in 1889, on May 31st, found a huge wall of water coursing to their town of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And if anyone escaped that with their life, it's because they took nothing with them. There was absolutely no time for possessions. And what we see is this, depending on how much time you have, you make different decisions. And so the people in Jericho are asking this question, how much time do we have and is Jesus going to basically bring this age to an end and will he do it basically within a week's time? And Jesus wanted to respond to those people and he wanted to correct the word on the street. And the word on the street is that everything is just about ready to wrap up. And to that, Jesus tells a parable in which he basically says, now hold your horses there. What you're saying basically has a little miscalculation in your calendar planning. Something cataclysmic will happen in, in Jerusalem. In fact, Jesus will be crucified in Jerusalem. But the end of the age is not coming right now. 
And in the length of time that's going to be between now and when the end of the age does come, what I want you to know is there is going to be a huge split decision about this person who will return king. And that split decision is going to affect what happens to just about everyone. And so now we read part one of the story that Jesus tells, beginning in verse 12. He says this, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then return. So he called ten of his servants and he gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him. And they sent a delegation after him saying, We don't want this person to be king. Well, obviously, the character in this story is a very special person. Not everyone back then was a candidate to be king. This person was, and like Archelaus, he was going to take a trip before he would return as king. Now, if we learn something from Archelaus, what we learn is this, is that the trip required to become king would not be a short trip. Archelaus' voyage to Rome, even if the winds were blowing well, could take as long as a month because of all of the necessary stops along the way. And once he was there, it would take another month to return. And when he would arrive at the port city there in Rome, he could not expect for Caesar to be walking out of the great city and meeting him at the docks. No, he would have to wait his turn in line of all of the other people who wanted to talk to Caesar, and Caesar would get to him when Caesar would get to him. And how long it would take Caesar to make that decision? Well, no one knew. And so when Archelaus left on his voyage, it could have easily taken between three and five months before he came back. Well, if we were to put that in our clock today, let's say that somebody was leaving Dubois now, and if they were coming back in three months, that would put them in the middle of May. And in the middle of May, a few things will look different and a few things would need to be done. And so this would-be king needs to set things in order before his trip happens because while he's gone, well, the fields need to be prepared and the crops need to be planted, the roads need to be fixed and construction needs to be started. And so the, this would-be king wants to mobilize his servants and he calls 10 of them together and what he does is he gives each one of them a certain sum of money. He gives them all a mina. Now, a mina would have been a hundred drachma worth of finances, which doesn't say much to us. But back then, it would be about three months' wages of income. And he gives it to the servant, and his instructions are clear. I want you to put this to work. I want you to do something with this. I want it to be profitable. And for each one of those servants, this was a grand occasion because they had the opportunity to demonstrate their competencies and their skills. They had freedom to be sort of more independent in how they would work. It was a wonderful opportunity. And while this story is interesting, the great twist in the story is found in verse 14. For you see, as that person leaves to go and become king, there are people who want to head him off at the pass. It says this, and some of his subjects, well, they hated him and they sent a delegation after him and they said, we don't want this person to be our king. And so their thought was this, back home, uh, there was a divided opinion about this person and not everyone was for this nobleman. And some of these people wanted to take him down. They wanted to issue a recall for his authority. They wanted to block his coronation. And those people sent a delegation trying to head him off before he became king. And that meant that this story became intensely political. You see, there were some people who were for him and there were some people who were against him. And so when he sailed off, did you really know what would happen while he was gone, and in what capacity would he come back? Well, people didn't know. It was uncertain. And so there was a split decision about this person. There were two different ways that people considered the outcome could be. Everyone has their opinion, and back home there's a split decision. In verse 14, as it comes to a close, we find that people have questions in their minds. What will happen to this nobleman on the trip? We're not quite sure. What will the people do back home while they're waiting for him? How will they play their cards? 
And what we find is that every single person will choose how they play their cards between the nobleman's departure and his return. And how those cards are played will make it clear what each and every person believes about that nobleman. Now, as an application of all of this, Jesus has done us a great favor, for he has just described a situation that we are quite familiar with. You see, from the time that he has gone to be with the Father, ascended into heaven, between that time and when he comes back, installing the entirety of the kingdom of God, we find ourselves living in a tension of a society that has a split decision on who he is. Who is Jesus? Well, there's lots of opinions about that. Is he worthy of our time? People have different views on that as well. Should he be king or should someone else be a king? You know that there's different people who stand on different sides of that equation. And so we find ourselves in a split decision in which there is great debate. And in that context of a split decision, you and I, we have to make our choices on what we do with what Jesus has said. Now, if there was no split decision, if we only lived in a context in which everyone said, hey, you're serving Jesus, you're loving him, and you're giving him your very best, you're, you're working so that his kingdom grows, man, that's great, that's awesome, I applaud you and I cheer you on. If we lived only in that situation, that would be rather easy for us to move forward because we would all agree. But we live in a situation in which some people, when they hear that we are serving God and trying to put to work the mina that he's given to us, they look at us and they say, say what? What are you doing? Why are you giving time to him? I mean, we don't even want him to be our king. Are you even sure that he's coming back? And in that context, it is quite a bit more challenging serving this great God while he's away in the midst of this split decision. You see, each and every one of us lives in a context in which we're going to have to ask and answer a question. And the question is this, what am I going to do in this interim between the moment when Jesus left and when he's coming back? You see, my uncle tells me that he thinks this whole Bible thing is rather exaggerated. And I have a friend at work that thinks, well, if I just go to church a couple times and if I'm a decent human being, I'm pretty sure that's a passing grade. And you and I know that the news basically would say that it is now a minority opinion that thinks that Jesus is so important and that he's going to be returning quickly. And there are folk out there who will ridicule the dedication that we have. There is a difference of opinion about Jesus and the question is what are we going to do during the interim well it's not surprising that there's a split decision you see there was a split decision about Archelaus as well there were some people that from the moment he left their thought was when he returns he's going to be a loser he'll be humiliated he'll be nothing when he comes back when he returns we're going to toss him out of town because he'll never have his dad's role when he returns, we're going to send him crying to his mama because that guy's nothing. That's my opinion. And in the same town, there would be people who'd say, uh, -uh. when he returns, he's moving to the top floor, top floor of the palace. When he returns, it is his policies that will be enacted. When he returns, it is going to be this guy who is our king. And you see, what's true about us today is this. We live in a world that has a divided opinion about Jesus, and this demands that you and I have greater convictions. Because Jesus asks us to stay faithful, even when there is uncertainty and a different view about who he is. And the storms will rage, and the winds will blow, and Jesus asks us to be faithful and we must ask the question, so what am I going to do in this interim? Well, if part one of the story ends in verse 14, it really does pick up in verse 15. You see, in verse 14, he has left and he has gone for quite some time. And now in verse 15, he comes back. And the first words from verse 15 are this, And he was made king. And he will return home as king. 
His prediction that he would be king, it is fulfilled, and he will come back not as a nobleman. He will come back more elevated, more powerful, more impressive, and this king is going to come back wearing a crown, and he will be calling our names. And as he calls his names, this king will require from every single person that they will give an account for the work that they did because he entrusted them with Amina and he entrusted them with the responsibility, put this to work while I am gone. And the king comes back and he calls people to give an account. And I'll tell you what we don't find in the text. We don't find in the text that when the king came back, he pulled each servant aside and he said, hey guys, I... I realized that while I was gone, there was kind of a debate about, you know, whether I was really going to become king or not. And some people didn't even know if I'd make it through the trip. And so, you know, I kind of get it that uh, that there was all of this uncertainty. And so so I'm going to make an adjustment in my expectation because of the uncertainty. There's no word about an adjustment in expectations because of uncertainty. Now, this king expected his servants to, to serve him in the midst of the uncertainty. And he calls them into an account, and the first one, it goes like this. And the first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, the master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in the very small matter, take charge of ten cities. Now, I think we learn all sorts of things about the king from this little exchange. First, we learn that the king is a giver. It all started when the king gave that man something Gave that man something that he could use that would be a blessing. And when that man was faithful, guess what the king does? He shows his character and his nature. He gives him even more. And what he gives him now is astounding. While Amina may not be that much in terms of wealth, three months wage, a city is incredibly valuable. An entire city. He's supposed to now be in charge of 10 cities. Well, how valuable is a city? I saw an article by the New York Post that, that gave New York a value, New York City, a value of $1.3 trillion. That's billions and billions and billions of dollars of value. The king says, man, I'm so happy with what you've done. Let me, let me show you what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you charge of 10 cities. Absolutely amazing. Second servant comes to the king, and the king says something similar. He says, sir, your mina has earned five more. I understand that you gave it to me, and now I'm returning it with everything else that I have earned. And the master said, take charge then of five cities. And we see that the king gives this person again something which is ridiculously wonderful. The king shows that he is good, that he is gracious, that he is on the side of the servant and I think the servant is overly impressed with what happens in fact if we were to take a summary of what these two sermon servants experience when they interact with the king what they find is that they have a good and a gracious king who is for them who gives them who appreciates them and who has a place in his kingdom for them it is such a beautiful picture And if the story were to end here, it just would have been a story with a happy ending. But there is a third servant who is called. And that third servant seems to have a drastically different opinion about the king. In fact, his words go like this. He says to the king, I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. Boy, the picture that he paints of a king is this king is sort of nasty, and this king is mean, and this king isn't very fair, and this king is somebody that you would like to avoid. And I have a question for you. Does this sound like the same king that the other servants had just met with? It doesn't, but consider this. It is the same king that gave each one of them the same thing. And yet there is such a radical, radically different view of who this king is between these three people. And I wonder if the distinction between how each of them views the king was not described right at the very beginning. You see, there were some people who were for the king and wanted to serve him. And there were some who were against the king. There were some who wanted to be faithful and there were others who, who weren't quite sure what they wanted to do. And I wonder if that distinction is what sent 
sent this man in a totally different direction. And his view of the king was rather different. He considered the king to be harsh, and he considered the king to be a person who wasn't gracious. And he says this. He says, uh, because I thought that you were a hard man, because you take what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sell, what I did was I, I just covered up and I buried my mina. And the master responds to this person, and the master's response is rather severe. He says, you know, buddy, I'm going to judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then did you not put my money on deposit, and when I came back, I could have at least collected interest? Let's consider this servant. First of all, his affirmation is, that he reaps where he did not sow. Is that an accurate description of this person? Or was not that servant someone who was given the exact same opportunity as the other servants? They didn't say that he reaped where he didn't sow. No, I think this person has a distorted view of uh, his great master. And the master says, you know what I don't quite understand about you? If you had considered me to be somebody who was so harsh... And so unfair, I'm just kind of wondering, why is it that you did not at least put the funds that I had given to you in the bank in order that it would make some money? I mean, can you explain to me your passive indifference? You're telling me that you fear me, and yet you've done absolutely nothing. Can you explain yourself? And I think there is only silence that comes from this servant. And here is my guess about this servant. My guess is that this servant, who received from the master the mina, he ended up listening to that split decision that was in society. And he had quite a few friends that weren't quite sure whether he would come back or not. And he had quite a few friends that weren't quite sure whether he'd be moving into the upper level of the palace or not. And in the midst of all of that uncertainty, this person wasn't quite decided enough to be faithful to what the king had requested him to do. And so what we have is we have a story that has a nobleman. And this nobleman gives assignments to people and then he goes on a long trip. And when he comes back, he is king. And he asks for every single person to give an accounting for what they have done. And for those who have done what he has asked, the beautiful thing is that faithfulness is rewarded by this king. Faithfulness is honored. Faithfulness is greeted with something that you could never imagine receiving. You shall lead cities. But at the same time that this king returns, not only is faithfulness rewarded, but opponents are defeated. For there is judgment, and those who did not want him to be king are people who will be judged most harshly. And I believe that in this story, what we find is we find someone who has suffered from the context of a split decision. And he permitted the context of debate and uncertainty to erode his will to serve his king. Sort of forgot that he was coming back. Sort of forgot that he was asked and given a, a job. And therefore, he didn't do anything with what had been given to him. And the sad thing is, is even that little which was given to him is taken and given to someone else. But the faithful are rewarded. Not those who are passively indifferent. Well, that does make us ask questions about ourselves. For what you and I desire in our relationship with the Lord, is this, that he would find us faithful. That he would see that what he has invested in us, that we have used it and we have been good stewards, and because we loved him, we have gone out and we have put it to work, and he will bless it if that is the case. But he will not smile on passive indifference, even if passive indifference is generated by the uncertainties that other people bring up and say, well, they think that it's not quite clear. Oh, it is. There is a king and his name is Jesus. 
And everyone will give an account. And it is our pleasure to take that which he has given and to use it in his name. And he promises this, that at the end of the days, those who are faithful, he will abundantly reward. It is ridiculously wonderful what we are waiting for. Therefore, what we want to do is we want to work well with that mina that's been given to us. Have you met anyone like that? Have you met somebody who does a good job working with what God has given them? And when you think about them, your thought is, here are faithful people. On my list of faithful people is Bill and Judy Slater. Boy, I met them 35 years ago. I was attending a church, and Bill was a Sunday school teacher, and I saw that Bill had passion for the Word, and that's what I saw when I was at church. But you know what I saw when I ended up visiting their home? I, I saw that here was a couple that constantly, constantly served other people, constantly, constantly were helpful to others, constantly were gracious, constantly were talking about Jesus, constantly were wanting to be his vessels, and there were so many people who were blessed because of Bill and Judy Slater. Bill worked in a pharmaceutical company, and and he took that great mind that he had and he applied it to studying scripture. And, and before long after I had gone overseas, I heard that Bill had, uh, he had taken up a, a new hobby, which was a great hobby. He ended up being one of Bible Study Fellowship's primary lead teachers in the city of Chicago. And men from all over the city, they would come and they would study God's word and Bill would be leading them because Bill was taking the mina that he had been given and he was, and he was putting it into practice. He was putting it into use. And I am convinced that many people are blessed because of Bill and Judy Slater. You see, they took what they had and they said, God, how can I use this for you? And our good Lord has watched them work with that mina for all of these years. These are the kind of people that will be greeted by those words of our Savior, well done, my good and faithful servant. And those are words that I long to hear as well. And you see, they have been good and faithful servants despite the fact that there is a split decision about Jesus, despite the fact that there is uncertainty in our society, despite the fact that many people might laugh and ridicule because they don't think that the king is coming back. But Bill and Judy, they have rock-solid convictions. He is coming, and he is king, and therefore great will be their reward. I have little doubt, and I long and desire for the reward that you receive to be great as well, mostly because that means that you will have served your Jesus with your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind, and that is a life worth living. Father God, we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you that you have given us a mina to work with. We thank you for your instructions. And yes, yeah, sometimes it gets us a little nervous because we may not be completely confident that we know how to put it to work yet. Show us and guide us. Give us the courage and give us the focus to not be distracted by this divided, split decision of society. We pray that we would hear your voice and do what you say despite the fact that we have naysayers who don't want Jesus to come back and be the king. But we do want you coming back. We do want you to be the king. So teach us, Father, day by day to be faithful and to use what you've given to us for you and for your glory. And that you would reward us? Who are we to receive such from the goodness of your hand? Once again, we find that you are gracious and we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.